It's going to be about um, migration, open borders, and, uh, and Marxism. So uh, just to start, I mean, I think migration today is probably the most central political issue, I think, in Belgium, in Europe, and in the world. I mean, you can see it in, um, um, in, the, uh, in the elections, basically, where a lot of politicians uh, and, and voters are putting migration on the top of the priority list. Eh? For example, the election of Trump is a reflection of that. The referendum of Brexit, I think, was a reflection of that. Uh, but you see it also in, in Europe, I mean, in Italy, in the elections, it's a topic. In um, Eastern Europe, we have, uh, um, you know, the far right that has been elected on these, uh, on these issues. In, uh, in Belgium as well, and in surrounding countries, we have Le Pen in France, we have Wilbex in, uh, in the Netherlands, we have uh, Macron in France, who's now passing a new legislation to uh, make, uh, basically, to restrict migration more and to hunt down, um, basically, um, you know, um, um, uh, undocumented workers. Right? So, um, so it's an issue everywhere and also outside Europe, I should say. I mean, if you look at Africa, for example, and, and in many countries in, uh, in Asia, uh, migration is, is important there. Uh, in the meantime, it's also, you know, uh, leading to inhumane situations, I would say, all across Europe. Eh? Um, most famous is, of course, the Mediterranean uh, Sea or the Mediterranean graveyard eh? with 30,000 uh, people who, uh, who uh, drowned basically over the past 15 years and this number is increasing because uh, in 20, 10, 15 years ago it was about 500 people that died every year now we are three to 4,000 people every year that die. Yeah? Um, there was the iconic photo if you remember a couple of years ago of this small boy, the Syrian boy Adan who drowned and actually was lying on the beach you know, uh, um, in Turkey who, who, who drowned, okay? a three-year-old uh, boy. Very often the uh, the drownings are, are large incidents also. It's, uh, it's very often like last year there was a boat that sank and it was 200 people who died in, in one, one night basically. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, to 2015, there was one boat where 800 people died, yeah. which is huge. It's the same thing as the Titanic. The number of passengers who, who drowned on the Titanic was 815. All right? So it's the same proportions. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's underestimated the importance of what is going on in the Mediterranean. At the same time, we have things like, uh, you know, a lot of migrants that are being imprisoned in what are de facto concentration camps. We have small incidents of uh, uh, border patrol guards who fire at migrants. We had these incidents in Soita. We have them in, uh, in Bulgaria. We had them. It's, it, it's still, it's an exception, but still, I mean, it's, it's worth noting it because it's completely crazy that we are firing actually on people moving and eh, trying to move. Um, every day in Europe we have scandalous deportations. Yesterday in Norway there was a girl, 18 years old, who was deported to Afghanistan, a country where she's never been. All right? And we, we have these stories all the time in every country. Um, there is the deal between the European Union and Turkey, which is a scandal because it's basically in violation of, uh, of international, basically of the, the, the Convention of Geneva, the famous refugee convention that says that a refugee should be able to claim asylum in the country where he or she um, enters, right? The, the deal with Turkey says, you know, all the people from Syria who come in, we just send them back, right? So it's a violation of the, of the UN treaties. It's a scandal. The agreement with Libya is even worse because they, um, they basically, you know, the Lib there is no Libyan government. I mean, it's complete chaos. It's ruled by, by, by almost monsters. And these people, they arrest uh, all the migrants, they put them into concentration camps, and they're even selling some of these people as slaves to work in the agriculture in, in Libya. Okay, this is, I mean, this is the case. Okay, this has been documented by Amnesty, and this has been a, an incident. Um, so, okay, this is the background where we are in Europe. Okay, in Belgium, I think, uh, maybe also interesting. Uh, so. We have, we have a similar situation, if not worse. Okay? In Belgium, the, the, the Minister for Migration, Theo Franken, who is a right-winger, um, recently basically arrested 100 people from Sudan, migrants who come from Sudan. And you should know that Sudan is a, is a brutal dictatorship uh, ruled by Omar al-Bashir, who is uh, hunted by the, uh, the UN High Criminal Court. You know, he's wanted for genocide, basically, in Darfur two years ago. And this guy, you know, everybody knows that when, uh, in the past, when migrants were returned to send back to um, Sudan, that they were arrested there, that they were interrogated, that they were regarded as rebels, okay, and tortured. Okay, that's the situation in, in, in Sudan. And so, 
what did Theo Franken do, our, our so-called minister? Um, he invited Omar al-Bashir, you know, to send a couple of people from his government to come in and identify these 100 migrants to say, you know, and to see who, who they could send back. And then they started sending them back, which is an absolute scandal. It was the same thing as if you would invite the Nazi regime, the, the SS, to come and look at the people you just arrested and say, who would you like us to send to you? I mean, it's completely horrible. I mean, it's completely unacceptable. Uh, last month, there was an incident in Belgium, um, four weeks ago, um, in Jabeke, not so very far from here, where 20 police officers entered um, you know, a place where there were migrants trying to catch basically um, uh, lorries that go to the, to the United Kingdom. And so they, they entered there for a razzia, a raid. And so many of these migrants panic because they, you know, they, they have the idea that when they're arrested, they're going to be deported and every effort is going to be in vain. Right? So they, they panic, they run away. And one of these guys, 39-year-old guy from Ethiopia, runs, panics, runs across the highway and is hit by a car with that okay, immediately. So this, this is the kind of things we're seeing in Europe every day in Belgium as well. Um, actually, the, the woman who drove the car, I read an interview with her. It's interesting because she was afterwards, she, she feels very guilty. But she has a, a good, uh, she, she was speaking very well. She said, what the police are doing, it's crazy. I mean, they're hunting these people like rabbits, is what she said. And it's just next to a highway. They're completely crazy. What are they doing? It's completely irresponsible. She's right. So at the same time, against this background, we have um, basically a debate on migration, a political debate, which is monopolized by the right wing, I think in any country, especially in Belgium. Um, the left basically does not propose an alternative. And the truth is that many people on the left think that this is a right wing issue. Okay, this is an issue that we should leave to the right and we should be silent about as the left wing. Uh, many people think that. There's even people on the left who actually say that, who actually say, you know, let's, let's not speak about this thing, which is, uh, which is, I think, very wrong. Okay, I think that I will make the position and defend the position that we should develop a program of the left and confront the issue and, and try and convince people of a left-wing program towards migration. Hmm? It was very clear in Belgium recently after Bart de Wever, who is the leader of the, the Nationalist Party in Belgium, a right-wing politician, very famous in Belgium, who published an opinion piece in a major newspaper in Belgium, the Morgen, saying the left should choose, they should know what they want. Either they want migration or they want to defend social security. You cannot have both, that's what, it, that's what he said. So it's, it's a major provocation because this guy, it presents itself as the savior of social security, but the reality is that he, he makes every effort to destroy the social security, okay? He's cutting pensions and he's cutting everything, okay? And, and, and unemployment benefits, and then this guy is claiming to be the, the savior of social security. So it's crazy, but anyway, the most interesting thing about it was that the, so the left-wing parties in Belgium, and by that I mean the social democracy and the Green Party and things like that, their reaction is crazy. They basically agreed with, um, with Bart de Wever, they, by saying, no, but Bart de Wever, he's overreacting, uh, nobody is in favor of open borders, um, you know, um, we, we, we agree that, you know, oh, people who don't belong here should be put on a plane, we should deport them, everybody agrees on that, so he shouldn't, he shouldn't be accusing us and things like that. That was the reaction of SPA in, in Jerusalem, all right? Um, even worse, in some countries, right, I don't know, politics of every country, but in, for example in the UK, there are some left-wing organizations who support Brexit, support Brexit and the vote on Brexit, um, because of the immigration issue. Okay? So they actually uh, are against immigration because of the logic that it suppresses wages, you know, and that capitalists use it, I will come back to this, um, and, and therefore they called to vote in favor of Brexit, all right? um, which is, I think, completely wrong. All right? Even the, in Belgium, the PVDA, the PTB, so the main uh, party of the left, which is a great party, which is, I mean, uh, my favorite party, so to speak, but, uh, and so which, to be honest, uh, is the only party who actively uh, organizes solidarity campaigns with, with migrants and with undocumented workers, and they're, they're doing great things. But still, you see that they are hesitant, all right? They, they don't come forward with the program on migration. And it's for people who follow the PVDA, uh, it's very uh, clear to see because there was a time 20 years ago in which they had a program on migration. Now they are silent about it. Okay, so they, they're hesitating. Okay, because they're they're a bit afraid. Uh, so so this is a debate. Now 
We argued that the, the answer of the left wing should be very clear. I mean, our answer to Bart Weber should be something like, I mean, you know, Bart Weber has to make a choice. I mean, what, what future does he want for, you know, for us, for our children, for our grandchildren? I mean, do you want them to grow up in, like, Europe surrounded by walls, right, where immigrants keep climbing the walls and we have border patrols, like, in the end shooting them or something? Is that kind of the future vision? Uh, he's presenting, or do we want to move towards a world in which you know we have uh, liberty of movement, in which people can move, and uh, towards an open society? That's basically the question, and uh, that's a real question, not the question he's posing. Okay, um, I think our answer should be that that migration is a is a basic human right. Right, that's that's the thing that needs to be defended. That people have the right to move. Eh? Um, for whatever reason, I mean, perhaps to uh, for a better life, eh? but uh, it can be for for other reasons as well. Perhaps to study, all right, or perhaps to um, you know to because you love somebody or because you want to see the world or for adventure or whatever. There may be many reasons. Hmm? So I think we should have a position more of that uh, uh, that the planet basically belongs to everybody and that borders. Okay, we should understand borders as in a historical sense. Okay, borders were were a human invention. They are created by you know feudalism and leftovers from imperialism and things like that. They are they they belong in the dustbin of history, I would say today, because people cross them more and more. Um, we should also realize that migration and movement it, today is very discriminatory in the world. I mean, there is a lot of discrimination in the rights of movement and migration. The reality is that you know many people, including us, I think. Um, are pretty mobile in, in the way we move. We should acknowledge that. Well, many others in the world are very restricted in the way they can move. For example, it has been shown that a person from Belgium can travel around the world um, to 174 countries without a visa. Okay? Whereas a person from Morocco can only travel for, to 59 countries and a person from Afghanistan only to 25 countries. So you see, there's a big difference. And um, basically, even Europe discriminates on this basis. Eh? Europe, when, when it grants visa, for example, to people from Afghanistan, etc., it refuses them. Um, it refuses them basically simply because they are from Afghanistan. And that in itself is basically in violation of, you know, of international law, of even of the Belgian constitution. You cannot do something like that. You, can, you cannot just simply say, just because you're from that country, we're going to treat you differently. But that's actually what, what Europe is being doing. I mean, it's, uh, um, the fact is also the word migration today is associated with you know people from Sudan and people from Morocco and things like that. But the truth is, migration means moving. <laughs> okay, it's it's moving to another place and, and going to live in another place. And so, if you think about it, we all migrate. Everybody migrates all the time. I mean, you you migrate uh, as a student uh, in an Erasmus program. You mi we migrate. I don't know. Uh, uh, perhaps you, you move house because you want a job within Belgium in a different place or because you want to go and study somewhere or, um, I don't know, I was thinking there's these media figures in Belgium like Astrid Brein who goes to Hollywood in order to try her luck as an actor or to, to find love or things like that. But those are migrants, okay? And they, you know, now she returns, which is interesting. It often happens in migration. These are migrants, we should call it like that, okay? Uh, but nobody sees it like that. We only problematize the migration from, from you know, the poor. <laughs> That's basically the, the, the thing, okay? Now, when we advocate the, the right to migration, um, I think we um, go back in a, in a long tradition, a long there's a long history in Marxism of defending the basic right to migration. Um, for example, Marx himself, Karl Marx, when he lived in Brussels in the 1840s, he was deported himself, you know. He was, at some point, he was arrested and he was put, put across the border. So he was one of the, the deported, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the deported people from Belgium. So he's uh, one in a long list, okay, so it's interesting uh, that he has this in common with, let's say, the Sudanese people who were sent to Omar um, al-Bashir. Of course, in terms of his ideas, he also spoke about uh, migration. I mean, just a couple of elements in, in Marxist analysis that are relevant to migration are the fact that he make a, makes a class analysis, first of all. I mean, for Marx, the central contradiction in society is the one between capital and labor, between you know capitalists and workers. And so, Marx, for Marx, migrants are workers, right? Uh, just like native workers are workers, and so it, it actually it unites us. I mean, we are 
the same as immigrants in, in the sense that we are workers. And so that, that's, of course, a very uh, relevant thing in, in, in Marx's analysis. Also, Marx very clearly describes in Capital uh, how capitalists um, try to change the laws in order to regulate migration, in order, for example, to have more immigrants because they can use them for their, in their factories. And likewise, they try to prevent emigration. All right? They try to prevent their workers from leaving to a different country, right? which is interesting. He describes these things. Yeah? He also describes, Marx, the um, migration from the countryside to the cities because he's actually describing basically the proletarianization, uh, the, the development of the proletariat, of wage labor, as a process in which, you know, uh, people, agricultural, uh, you know, farmers, Moscow farmers, are cut off from their lands, from their means of production, and become proletariats. Mm -hmm. um, and so he basically describes their migration as the mechanism to which this proletarianization takes place. Okay, that's the central thing. Um, perhaps a final thing is also the internationalism in Marx. If you read the Communist Manifesto, uh, you will see that he is very, let's say, he sees the, the fact that boundaries, borders disappear in countries, he sees as, as, as a progressive development, okay, under capitalism. He sees, you know, there's a lot of problems with capitalism and he, he says capitalism should be abolished and replaced by socialism and socialist revolution is necessary, but he also says that capitalism, through its development, plays a historical progressive role in developing the productive forces, productivity, but also in, uh, you know, in creating larger scale states, for example, and, and, and cutting away with, uh, with borders and boundaries, okay? uh, which is also relevant from a migration point of view. Um, at a point in time, in 1867, Marx was actually involved in the creation of a political organization as well, the so-called First International, which tried to organize workers from across the world. And Marx was the ideologue and was writing a lot of speeches and, and things for this organization. And one of the things he wrote at that point was, um, you know, he's analyzing migration and he says, literally, I'm citing, he says, in order to oppose their workers, the employers either bring in workers from abroad by migration, or transfer their factories to countries where there is cheap labor, so by delocalization, if you like. Uh, and given the state of affairs, Marx concludes, if the working class wishes to continue its struggle with some chance of success, the national organizations must become international. That means the national organization of the working class must become international. That's, why, that's what he's actually building. It's interesting because the conclusion he draws from the migration and the fact that capitalists use migration, the conclusion is not that he says we should restrict migration, the conclusion is we should organize the working class on an international scale, okay? which is interesting to note. A couple of years later, in 1907, Marx was dead by then, but we had a different organization, the so-called Second International, where people like Lenin uh, were involved and, uh, and people like Rosa Luxemburg and, and, and Liebknecht and things like that. In 1907, the Second International had a conference in Stuttgart, okay? and there they had a resolution, they had a document on migration. In the end, they voted in favor of open borders. Okay? I'm citing again, from, you can find this online. Uh, so one of the things they said is, we ask the abolition of all restrictions which prevent nationalities from staying in a country and which exclude them from the social, political and economic rights. Okay? So they, they, want, they don't want any, any restrictions. There's more to it in the document, but I don't have the time to, to elaborate there. And for example, Karl Liebknecht, who was at this conference, who was a, a very famous socialist revolutionary, who was later shot together with Rosa Luxemburg. Um, this guy came back from this conference very en en enthusiastic, and he wrote an article, which we should translate, because it's only written in, in German. But it's an article which is basically, the title is something like Against Deportations, all right? That was written in 1907 against deportation. And what he says in this article, I'm, I'm translating, he says, down with, with the Damocles sword of deportation, so down with deportation, because this is the, first, because this is the reason why foreigners uh, basically uh, are forced to squeeze wages and break strikes. And he's right. Okay? The fact that, that there is the, the, the threat of deportation puts them in such a vulnerable position that they cannot do anything else than accept low wages and, and, and do things like that. And so that was very, very, very well uh, looked at from uh, Liebknecht. Um, the final thing is uh, Lenin. Lenin is, I think, the, the mo has the most clearest position on you know, the Marxist analysis of migration. He wrote a, a very short article, two-page article, called Capitalism and the Immigration of Workers. 
uh, I brought some copies of this article. Like, so it's, uh, it's very, uh, I recommend everybody to read it. And, you know, he repeats many of the things I've been, been saying. He says, uh, the, the cause of migration is in capitalism and is in colonialism. That's the reason why people migrate, all right? Uh, and he also says, you know, there is something progressive about migration. Because basically what migration does is it pulls people away from, you know, from their own provincial uh, um, places where they grew up and it spreads them across the world and it creates basically a sort of a unity, it will create a sort of a unity in the working class, a world working class, okay, which the, cap which, which the capitalists will be incapable of stopping, all right? So he's, he, he has a really internationalist uh, position there and he, he really sees this as a progressive development, which I think is, is really, uh, really an interesting and courageous, I think, uh, position. Mm -hmm. Just for completeness, I should also say that Marxists are not the only ones to advocate, I think, uh, open borders and the right to migration. In liberalism, there is the same thing. Adam Smith, um, you know, the ideologue of liberalism, also defended open borders, which is interesting because the liberal parties today in Europe don't defend this, but they claim to be the adherents of Adam Smith. So if you see people from Open VLD or parties like that, you should say, hey, you know Adam Smith was uh, in favor of open borders. What do you think about it? Okay. Same thing for The Economist, the magazine. The Economist is in favor of open borders. Okay. So it's not, it's not a very crazy idea or something. And they give good, good arguments for open borders, I think. So just to say one thing about this, because you may think, okay, when the liberals say something like that, should we Marxists uh, copy that position? Hmm? Um, you might say, you know, we cannot share the same program as the liberals, we're not liberals. Well, to some extent we are, okay? We, we share with the liberals uh, the values of, you know, equality and freedom, actually. I mean, freedoms are, are freedom is, is a basic, uh, uh, is in the, in, inherent in, in the program of Marxism. We want freedom. And the point is that actually the liberal parties of today, they are not really liberal. That's the truth. They have given up on liberalism. I mean, the, in, in order to be a liberal today, if you are consistent and if you are, you know, you should become a socialist because it's only socialism that can create equality that is the basis for, for freedom, actually. So it's, uh, you know, it's Marxism and socialism is actually uh, well taught through liberalism. That's, that's the way we should look at these things. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I would now like to go into um, a couple of ways in which I think Marx in economics uh, has a lot to say about migration, the analysis of migration. So, for example, um, many people analyze the, the causes of migration. Well, why do people migrate? Well, Marxists have a lot to say about this. I mean, it's, as I mentioned before, uh, many m people migrate away from conflict regions like the Middle East. And, you know, what is the root of this conflict? It's, it's imperialist military intervention, essentially. I mean, many of the migrants today are a direct result of the intervention of Tony Blair and George Bush in Iraq, you know, and the chaos that resulted from that is, is basically what is behind the chaos in, in, in the Middle East and, and the migration flows that, that followed from that. The same thing with the economic development. Marx already explained that capitalism has an inherent tendency of increasing inequality in the world. Okay? This was confirmed by Thomas Piketty, the, the, the French economist, and his data. Um, and that's, that's basically another source of migration flows. I mean, so if we don't stop the real causes behind migration, we're never going to solve anything, all right? And that's why the right wing has no program. We have a much better program on, on migration. Eh? The, today, the inequality is, uh, is you know, mind-blowing. Today, the, the richest 42 persons in the world have the same wealth as the combined wealth of the poorest 3.7 billion people, which is amazing, okay? Um, which brings me also to the, the so-called division between asylum seekers, you know, political refugees, and economic migrants, right? which, is, which is arbitrary in the final analysis. For Marxists, this is arbitrary, the distinction, because it doesn't matter whether you die from a brutal dictator that is hunting you down, or whether you die from hunger because you're, you're in a brutal capitalist economy. You know, it's, there's no distinction, so the distinction is, is meaningless, actually. Now, the second thing where Marxist economists have something to say is in the analysis of exploitation. Because, as I explained, you know, Marx um, explains that wages are determined by class struggle and that capitalists manage to exploit workers um, because workers have no alternative. They have to work. Hmm? Um, now, if you look at undocumented workers, hmm, they clearly have no alternatives. I mean, there's a threat of deportation, as Karl Liebknecht already realized. 
And it's visible. I mean, in, in a city like Brussels, it's very hard to know how many undocumented workers there are, but the best estimates we have is like we have 100,000 undocumented workers living in Brussels. They work because undocumented workers, they, if you don't work, you know, you don't live. Yeah? So they work in like the kitchens of all the restaurants in Brussels are full of, I mean, they're used, okay? Uh, and so they, they play a role in these economies and, and they're exploited at very, very low wages. Um, by the way, those people who think that restricting immigration is like reducing the stock of migrants in Europe are wrong, okay? And particularly with regards to undocumented workers. Everybody who's looked into these things realizes and, 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 and agrees that one of the reasons that undocumented workers stay here, you know, is because, because of the uh, fortress Europe. Okay? They know that if they return to their home countries, they won't be able to come back in, all right? And so if you would have an open border system, there would be much more return migration. We know that, okay? If you look at uh, places where there is the possibility of, uh, of open migration, there you see that there is much more return migration, okay? So people stay here, actually, and, and that creates a reservoir of, uh, of undocumented workers. That's the reality. So much of what we see as the negative consequences of migration is actually a result of the, uh, of the policies of, uh, of the right wing today in Europe. Hmm? Um, of course, the exploitation of workers is also related to um, things like social security and poor relief, you know, to, uh, to, to immigrants and to, um, you know, this is a difficult issue. But the point we have to realize is that one of the benefits of having social security, unemployment benefits, poor relief, etc., is that it allows workers to not accept any wage. Right? You're much stronger in your relation with a capitalist to demand wages if you know that you have an alternative in, in terms of an unemployment benefit. If you, if you have no alternative, you, you have to accept any wage. Right? That's why it's one of the very strong arguments of the labor movement for, for having unemployment benefits. Um, and so, yeah, we need them. Also, for if, if we don't organize them for migrant workers as well, then they're going to outcompete us. I mean, it's, uh, you know... Um, and basically, we should also realize that in history, in the 19th century, for example, there was, there was already a debate on who has to pay for migrants. Okay? When, when we had migration between cities, poor relief and, you know, at that time was, was organized at a local scale, at the municipal level. Right? And then some cities said, you know, we were not going to pay for these migrants and things like that. And this dilemma was actually solved through the working class because it, it conquered a national social security and unemployment benefit system that organized redistribution at a national scale, all right? And the same thing, I mean, there's no reason why the same movement, you know, the same uh, uh, increase in scale of, of redistribution would stop at, at the nation state. I mean, why not expand it to a European level? Why not, you know, in the future think about a, a world level redistributive systems? I mean, th that's the way we should think because migration um, asks us for solutions, and those are the kind of solutions we, we need to uh, move towards, I think. Um, a big debate, and a very important question is also, what is the effect of immigration on wages of natives, right? Um, so basically the idea that many people have around this, and it's, there's some truth in it, of course, is that migration increases the supply of labor, and we know from basic economics that if supply increases, then basically prices goes down, prices go down, and the price of labor is, or labor power, I should say, is, is the wage. So wages will go down. Uh, on top of that, uh, and Marx, Marx actually describes all these things also very well. Um, on top of that, there is the um, uh, the fact that immigrants are often used to create a division in the working class. All right, he already writes about this in the in the nineteenth century, Marx, saying that the Irish workers are. Uh, are brought into the um, in, to England basically to work in the factories in order to create two hostile camps between the workers to divide them in order for the capitalists to basically lower wages. All right, so we have these elements. Now, first of all, we should keep very well in mind that it's not because the capitalists have a certain interest in a certain policy like migration that we should have the opposite attitude. All right, that's I mean. 
That's not necessarily the case. I mean, that's the logic of a five-year-old uh, kid or something. You know, my sister wants the blue thing. I want, no, no, we should have a red thing. You know, that's, a, that's a kind of logic. I mean, no, <laughs> that's not necessarily the case. Think about something else, like technology or something. Okay? Capitalists also adopt technology in order to get rid of workers, which maybe go on strike or something like that. Does that mean, because the capitalists like technology, that we should be against technology or something? No, of course not. We, our position is that we have... Um, you know, we, uh, we embrace technology and we fight for socialism and revolution. And we, we say that, you know, under socialism we use technology for the benefit of humanity. Hmm? The same attitude you can have towards migration. I mean, it's not because capitalists, uh, um, you know, use migration to their benefit that we should oppose migration. You could say, no, we embrace migration, we fight for socialism, fight for revolution, and under socialism we will use migration to the benefit of humanity, because it is beneficial. If you allow people to move freely and go and stand wherever they like on the planet, it's a great thing. You can, you know, discover the world. You can go and live and study wherever you like. I mean, it's a great thing. We should acknowledge that. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing, those people who say, hey, but it lowers wages, you know, as a Marxist we look at a global scale, all right? If people move from place A to place B, you might say, okay, it's gonna lower wages in place B, but then you should also say that it, higher, it increases wages in place A, all right? So at least you should say something about that as well, okay? So there's a double effect. Um, uh, and perhaps the most important thing is this. What very few people realize is that it not just, migration doesn't only increases the supply of labor, but also it increases the demand for labor. Because these immigrants, they enter a country, they live here, they consume here, all right? They, their wages they earn, they're gonna spend it, all right? And so what happens in the end is that the, thing, the things they consume have to be made. They have to be produced by labor, all right? So it, it increases the demand for labor in a way in which economists, you know, expect that to be, in the end, the wage would arrive at the same level as the wage was before the immigration. And there's a good reason for that, because think about it, migration is basically a sort of like increase in the population. If the population of a country increases, wages should not differ. I mean, it's not like there's more inhabitants in Italy than in Belgium. Belgium is a small country. But that doesn't mean that the wages in Italy are, that's not the reason why the wages in Italy would be lower. I mean, you understand? I mean, it's, you know, it's simply unrelated. I mean, if, if there is a population increase, whether through migration or through birth rates or whatever, what happens is that everything, you know, I mean, if the population doubles, then, you know, in the long term, capital doubles, GDP doubles, and, you know, wages just remain the same. I mean, it doesn't, shouldn't have any effect, okay? Um, now, there's a bit of technicalities in this debate because, you know, what is the long term, uh, you know, on the, in the short term, you can, you can have a, de a decrease in wages. The question is, what is the long term? And there's some interesting evidence, by the way, uh, from economists. I, I study these things myself. Um, like one of the most famous labor economists in the world, David Card, did a very important study to, uh, into the Cuban immigration to Miami. That was a huge migration. Uh, in Miami, you get like an increase of 10% in the population and in the, in the, the workforce, all right? So it's a huge, sudden influx, migration shock. And what he finds is there's no effect on wages, simply no effect on wages. And so the, the argument there is that what he finds is that the migrants are absorbed into the labor market actually very, very rapidly. I mean, you see an expansion of uh, low-skilled sectors. And so, I mean, the point I'm trying to make here is that we have some evidence that suggests that um, even the long-term readjustment can go pretty quickly. All right, the long term can be, you know, perhaps one year or something like that. Okay, so it's a, um, but it, it's difficult because in other cases, like if you look at the Syrian mi migration to Turkey recently, the last couple of years, there was a huge migration shock as well. There you see for some groups in informal sectors and like housing prices, you see effects. Okay, so housing prices went up, wages in the informal sector went, went down. And so, okay, we should acknowledge that also, of course, any migration shock creates pressure on infrastructure. I mean, these people need a house. These people, you know, if there is, you know, a lot of people suddenly entering, if it's a sudden migration shock, then these people need a house, they, they may need schools and things like that. So the question is, you know, you should organize that, but there are means in society to organize this, all right? And I think socialism is much more capable in handling such short-term uh, transitions than escape capitalism, because under capitalism, 
uh, basically people arrive and you're unemployed and it's like you know everybody take care of themselves whereas socialism and a planned economy you know where there is full employment you can you can much more easily you know put people to work wherever there are needs in the, in the society all right again but I mean using wages that are the common agreed upon wages you know without introducing additional competition hmm? the same thing for for infrastructure I think it's much more easily uh, to, to manage in a, in, a, in a planned economy which by the way you can see in um, in countries like China, to a limited, I mean, I know China is, has a lot of, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of problems, etc. But at least in terms of urban planning and things like that, if they have migration and they have a lot of migration, they cope with it and they organize it. And you see examples of the way in which, um, you know, things are possible. Hmm? Um, so our answer is not to restrict migration, okay? But our answer to this question should be to fight for equal rights, basically, and, and common organizations. Hmm? Um, so a final uh, thing where Marxian economics could uh, um, contribute to the analysis of migration is in the discussion on, you know, could migration increase economic growth, can it reduce poverty in the world? Okay, it's, it's very often people who advocate who are in favor of my, migration say like, um, you know, it would, it would increase world GDP by 33%. Things like that, you read it. Um, and it's true, actually, I, I looked at these models, but the thing we need to understand um, um, is that what is behind these models, very few people understand what is behind this model. They say economists have predicted that it's going to increase world GDP by 33%. That's true, economists have predicted that, but the reason behind that is that they simply assume, it's very simple to understand, they simply assume that migrants, if they come from south to north, that are going to be producing in, in our countries at the same productivity level, as the workers here, okay? So if you assume that, then it's very simple, you know? If you have two billion people coming from poor countries to here, and here they produce at our productivity level, then obviously, in total, we're going to be producing a lot more, all right? So that's the idea. The question, of course, is, is this really completely realistic? I don't, I don't think it's completely realistic. So I, I, don't, I don't like this argument, to be honest, completely. Uh, too much. That's one of the arguments that's given by, by by more like people like the liberals, like the economists and things like that. They they give these kinds of arguments. I think they're the bad arguments. Uh, however, I do think we should acknowledge the role in reducing poverty because what many people basically uh, that migrate, they um, you know they're trying to switch from a, a, a capitalist who pays low wages to a capitalist who pays higher wages. And we should always defend the right of workers. To that, to that make that move, okay? And it's true. I mean, that that that, that kind of me mechanism in migration reduces poverty. Okay? It has the uh, cap capacity to reduce poverty, and there is evidence suggesting that it's much more important than, for example, development aid. Right. So it's in that sense. I think it's something we should uh, we should think about. So to conclude, I think um, there's some urgency in this discussion. I think. Um, um, you know, there's a rise of nationalism, of racism, which is a poison that has the capacity to actually result in clashes, perhaps, in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we should act now. Um, I think we should, um, first of all, we should recognize that this is a central political issue, eh? migration. We should uh, um, develop a program. Uh, think of a develop the program basically of migration. I think it should be based on internationalism and, and the right to migration, which we should defend. Mm. Of course, migration has a lot of um, side discussions, and I think we should think about these side discussions and develop them further into a program. I think we should do this together. Uh, and then launch a campaign. What, if, what we need is a campaign in the, in the labor movement among activists to actually you know, um, arm them with, with our program, with our theory, um, uh, that I've just sketched, and I think that, uh, together with with the migrants, has the capacity actually to, to change the world and to solve this very important issue. Because basically, I think you know, no person in the world is illegal. Eh? Um, migration is a human right, and to you know, use the words of Karl Marx, you know, workers of the world unite. Thanks.